Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have two amazing guests to introduce to you now. Claire and James Davis are a midlife and award-winning duo and owners of the world-renowned fitness brand 38 Degrees North. They are their creators of the phenomenally successful five-star rated The Midlife Mentors podcast. Their program, The Midlife Method, has been developed over the past 10 years, backed by years of research, experience, and client transformations that's had a profound and lasting impact on the lives it has touched. The science-based method promises strength and resilience in body, mind, and emotional well-being, giving clients the ultimate step-by-step toolkit for sustainable results. The Midlife Method program helps clients shed the body fat, regain health, reduce stress, and dramatically improve their quality of life without making big sacrifices. Claire and James continue to be a force of truth and integrity in the health and wellness industry, demystifying the fads, fake promises, and pseudoscience that plague our news feeds. Claire and James, it is a pleasure to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Hey, Casey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us on. We're thrilled. Uh, Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. It's an honor. I'm a little intimidated. <laughs> I'm outnumbered here oh. two to one. Oh, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be nice to you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, in trade for doing this interview, the, the Boundless Body Radio Research Team, which doesn't exist, um, is requesting access to a certain video that exists somewhere of a DJ Disco Davis. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh. <laughs> Right, so uh, that's amazing. You obviously heard the episode with Neil from um, Strictly Come Dancing, which I think is Dancing with Stars over there in the US. Um, he's a pro dancer, but yeah, um, Claire let drop that in my youth when I used to work for the legendary nightclub Ministry of Sound, um, we did produce this promo video of the glow stick <laughs> workout set to kind of like hard trance music and it's basically me jumping around with a load of professional dancers looking very glamorous me not having a clue what's going on don't worry i have a copy yes. and i'll tell you what if, if he doesn't do the cleaning up one day or something like or doesn't cook me a delicious meal one night which he always does but you know there's the other parts i just use that That's um, against him. it's it's just it's very special i mean anyone that's seen it just is their, their mouth is wide open wondering if it's actually real casey the other funny thing about this was um i was working for ministry of sounds magazine and we used to do like a cover mount cd and put little videos on so this was like a, an april edition it was an april fool's joke so we'll pretend we're doing a glow stick workout with this little promo and actually, as soon as the magazine came out, people were phoning the club, going, I can't find it. Where can I buy it? That's <laughs> of amazing. It didn't really exist. Well, it doesn't fit now, and it's it's a shocker. I've never seen anything like it. And Neil Jones, we that's showed amazing. Neil Jones, oh, and he was like, I, I can't believe that exists. I can't believe it's real. Oh, that's awesome. I don't know where that fits in with your retreats or if it fits in your programs or I haven't, I, you guys put out a ton of content, but I haven't come across that one yet. And so I'll keep, I'll keep looking for it. <laughs> I feel like we need to recreate it. it there's oh, been, that's, please, there's, that's not. There's, there's been a lot of talk about this since we mentioned it on our podcast with Neil Jones. Um, so I, I feel like there's, we need to put Jones on the spot in his parachute trousers and his glow sticks uh, <laughs> and see what happens. That's amazing. I will be watching out for that for sure. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> so great to talk to you guys. So how did the two of you meet? Oh, what a great question. Uh, you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, what you were saying, how, how, how the glow stick workout fits into what, so, uh, what we do and where we are. Because I was so into um, the whole club scene way back and worked for Ministry of Sound, I spent many summers in Ibiza, which uh, for British people was like, you know, you go there in summer to party. It's like, it was like, the, I guess, the, the club of Vegas of Europe. So I fell in love with the island, which is why I later went back there to establish 38 Degrees North, which was a fitness retreat company. So I wanted to, I kind of got past all the, the late nights and uh, I was more into early nights and early mornings and training. But I was like, this, the island is beautiful. And I want to bring people out to train in nature have a great time, pass on some of the knowledge. And uh, Claire and I actually met out there. We did. Um, and then she took a very, very decision to quit everything in the UK and come out and move in with me and <laughs> be the better half of the business, basically. <laughs> yeah, it was um, it was exciting. It was exciting. So I used to spend time over in Ibiza as well. So I was introduced to James about 10 years ago. Um, and he already had 38 degrees north. I was doing... I actually re-qualified when I was 30 to do all my nutrition, my PT, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I was actually going over there and doing a lot of coaching because that's my background as well. So I was doing a lot of 
uh, business coaching at the time, stress management consulting. And so I was going over there doing bits and pieces for other retreats. And then lo and behold, we both went through divorces. And then after that, got together. Mm. Well, yeah. that's that was going to be my next question for each of you, actually. I wanted to know what kinds of challenges you had to face in, you know, whatever was your past life and lifestyle before that ended up, you know, it's a, a challenge that was very difficult at the time, but ended up being, you know, such a blessing later on in life. So many. <laughs> well, I, don't I, I don't know where to pick. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in, like, you know, life teaches you lessons and you learn from them and go forward. And I think Steve Jobs saying, you know, life only makes sense looking backwards. I think for me, I've got so many to pick from as well. I think for me, like, taking the decision to move to Ibiza, I, I, kind of, I kind of just went in head first. Things didn't really work out too well on the business side, first of all. So that was, like, a massive learning and I had to really get creative and struggle to reinvent and find, I guess, my resilience to, to see things through. Uh, I, yeah, that impacted my marriage, um, which then ended up, ended up in a divorce. But then, you know, on the flip side, you know, where it's panned out now is we're, you know, I found Claire. <laughs> she's amazing. And, and we're doing such good work and reaching so, so many people now. Like, you know, life just takes you in unexpected directions sometimes. And you can plan and make goals. And it's definitely good to do that. And, you know, it's part of what we do. But also being open to, a, you know, the way life can take you sometimes and, and being able to spot the opportunities and being resilient enough to turn a crisis into an opportunity. I think for me, um, leaving my entire life basically to go over to Ibiza and work with James in his already established business. You know, I, I'm a very independent woman. I've gone through quite a lot um, in, in my divorce. It wasn't particularly amicable. I was starting a new career. Um, I decided to give up my career in PR to do all my PT and nutrition and everything. So I had a mortgage. I left my, my home that I just bought um, and my mortgage and this life I was building around this new career and decided to to leave all of that to go in to go and live with James over in Ibiza, which was his home, his business. So it was it was quite for an independent woman um, that had been through quite a lot and wanted to hold on to the things that she had managed to salvage out of her previous marriage and also starting to work in a new profession and building that. That was that was a challenge. But obviously, I thought he was worth it. And, you know, it's turning out all right. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly seems like it. I love how, um, you know, how choosy you were with your words there. When you're talking about, you know, these challenges, you're talking about, you know, resilience. And not not that it was a, a failure, but it was a learning. Can you talk about how some of those difficult moments in life end up being some of our most meaningful later on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we have, like, uh, as a society, a big fear of failure and the word failure, you know. Um, but what we need to remember is, like, failure is not a permanent state. And, like, unless we're failing, I think it was Winston Churchill says, that, show me the man who has not failed, I'll show you the man who has not tried, you know. If we're staying in our comfort zone and we're just being comfortable, then we're not going to fail because we're not pushing ourselves. You know, Thomas Edison, like, 10,000 attempts to create the light bulb, you know, and I think a journalist said to him, you know, oh, you know, you're a failure. He went, no, I just found 10,000 ways that haven't worked yet. Um, so I think it's really important that we start realising that, you know, when we take a risk, there's, a, there's always a risk that it could go really well. and We'll get what, we, what, what we're aiming for. There's a risk that it might not pan out. But the risk that it might not pan out, there'll always be a learning from it that you can apply for the next time you try. Um, and I think it's a really important mindset to start to develop. You know, uh, I'll give you one more quote, my favorite from Rocky. Like, it's not life isn't about how hard you can get, get how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep getting up and keep going forward. That's on our wall, isn't it? Yeah. In London, that's on our wall in London. But I agree with everything that James has just said. It's you know, we always say every time you go to a new level in your life, there's another devil sitting on your shoulder telling you why you can't do it and why it's risky, um, why you're going to fail. Remember all of the times you 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 didn't do that and it failed and you looked silly and you were humiliated, but that's the whole beauty of life. That's when you start to trust yourself is actually when you just jump before you're ready. Um, and that's what we're here to do. We're supposed to expand. We're supposed to experience our life full of adventure. That's how I, how we see it. So we take lots of risks, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Wow. Well, I really love your podcast. And that episode was honestly like one of my favorite, Another Level, Another Devil. I'm sitting next to one of my favorite books written by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art, where he talks about overcoming resistance anytime that we want to make ourselves better. Like if we want to do, you know, make ourselves worse in some way or like gain a lot of weight or, you know, get get unhealthy, like it's pretty easy to do, (laughs) especially in our society sets it up so easily for us. But it's only when we try to create or learn or grow or, you know, deliver a new program or service that we're met with this kind of resistance that's pushing yeah. against us. And it's only when we show the universe that, yeah, we're, we're committed to this and we're, we don't have it perfect maybe, but we're going to, we're going to press record. We're going to sit down and write, we're going to create something. It's only then that the universe acknowledges like, yeah, okay, let's, let's give this person some help because they're showing up to do the work. Yes. Yes. Um, I always say the universe rewards the brave. You know, when we, when we step out, the universe goes, oh, okay, this, this person is, is willing to, to take a risk. It's willing to experience life as it's supposed to be experienced. And it trusts me, you know, there's, there's a, there's a sense of trust with whatever, when we say the universe, God, great spirit, whatever, it's actually saying, okay, you've got my back. I'm safe to do this. And I think it always rewards you when you do that. Not necessarily straight away. Sometimes it sometimes it takes things away from you that aren't meant for you, so that you can go for the things and actually see the things and get the blinkers off for the things you're supposed to get. Uh, I love that. I think that's wonderful. I do get frustrated with certain phrases that you know people throw around that they think is is kind of like a normal state of things when it's it's more like it's just kind of like the average. It's it's not normal. It's average. And you know people say like dad bod around here, and it's like dad bod just means you're going to get fat and lazy and whatever as you become a father. And it's like uh, I I don't like that phrase. I don't think that has to be the case. And another one that gets me a little frustrated is a midlife crisis. C- can we can we grow through our midlife without having it be a crisis? Exactly, and I love your two examples there. You know, what, one of the inspirations for us actually starting the midlife mentors journey was, you know, we were seeing so many of our contemporaries, like like friends of ours, just being like, oh, you know, this this is it, right? I just I just have the ever expanding waistline. I'm more sluggish. It is the start of the of the downward decline. And we're like, no, no, it does not have to be this way, you know. And I think that links nicely with the midlife crisis. And um, we're doing a lot in the UK right now. There's a lot of work around the female menopause and a lot of work, um, even like in organisations, kind of like explain the symptoms of it, Mm. how to work with it. Uh, And right now we're trying to raise awareness of of the male menopause as well, because, yeah, not many people are aware of it, but... You know, midlife crisis for men, we kind of have still have this unfortunate stereotype. You know, it's the guy suddenly buys like the, the shirt unbuttoned to his navel, and he's bought the sports <laughs> car, and he's got he's got the, the eighteen and twenty year old girl sat next to him. And Is that like, what you bought that shirt for the other day? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we know for men as well, they're going through this these hormonal changes. You now their testosterone is declining over time. They've eventually reached a point where where so many clients say to me, "Is like." I just don't feel myself anymore. Like I feel like my body's letting me down, you know, and, and it's, I guess it's a sense of our mortality. Um, but we haven't really been taught how to deal with it. We haven't really been explained like what's going on, like hormonally that's causing these physiological changes, also causing emotional and psychological changes for us as well. You know, testosterone plays a role in our central nervous system. It plays a role in our brain function. So um, we're getting, you know, the similar symptoms to women in terms of like, you know, anxiety, depression, brain fog. At the same time, men tend to define themselves in terms of their of their masculinity, you know, their strength, their power, their vigor. And if we haven't done anything and our testosterone has declined, you know, if we're not taking the positive steps of moving, nourishing ourselves right, it can be quite debilitating mentally to be like, well, you know, I'm not strong. I am putting on, you know, my belly's getting bigger and bigger. Or my libido is dropped out. Um, and, and men don't tend to open up and start to talk about it. So we want to start having a conversation going, look, you know, this isn't your fault. This is what's going on inside the body as part of the aging process. But there are definitely 100% things you can do with your lifestyle that are going to help you address this and just go forward with more positivity and feeling better. Yeah, I think it's a time where people's self-identity, like they've really, really lost their sense of self and their sense of identity. You know, a lot of the stuff that they've been going after doesn't necessarily fulfil them. So all the things that society said they should do and all those things that they've gathered around them, the material things or the status, and then they're like, okay, hang on a minute, I'm not fulfilled. And then they're in 
the middle of their life with the second act, we always put it a second act facing them. And they're thinking, hang on a minute, is this it? And also I think with the, the men and women that we speak to and we work with, it's a real lack of communication. So uh, firstly, it's awareness because awareness is what precedes change. You can't change what you don't know. So our passion is really to create awareness so people are compassionate with themselves and then their partners as well because the lack of communication about all this stuff that's going on for them physically, mentally and emotionally, you know, like even James touched on their libido. People aren't even, so there's all these assumptions that we're making with our partners potentially at this time of our life in relationships. Whereas if awareness comes into it, people feel a bit more hopefully comfortable to talk about it. Mm. So where can people start to kind of open up to talk about it? Because again, if, if somebody's not aware of that, how, uh, where, where does that conversation start? I think a really good place to start um, if you're feeling anything is at home with your partner. Because often like what we see is unfortunately in midlife partners can tend to, to kind of silence up and go in different directions. Mm. So the distance between them gets greater because both of them aren't feeling themselves due to due to what's going on with menopause for you know for both genders. Uh, and just start to talk about how you're how you're feeling, maybe some of the physical things that you're noticing, uh, and just look for support from your partner. Uh, for men, I think men aren't as good as opening up to their to their buddies generally, but you need to be, you know, like just have a chat with a close buddy. And you know, they might surprise you by that they're feeling or experiencing similar things. And then, you know, you can make a plan together. Mm. I'd also say, like, for, for women, it's about kind of scribing, just becoming aware of what, you know, your triggers are in your relationship, for example, like what your triggers are, what are some of the um, belief systems behind that. Actually having, I suppose, a lot of um, the women I speak to in all the groups that I'm in as well, Actually, there's a massive awareness now for of the menopause over here in the UK. I've done a podcast last week because it was World Menopause Day last Monday. And I did loads of uh, workshops and lives with the US. And it, it really surprised me because so many people from the US were like, menopause is just not being talked about. You guys are just leading the way over in the UK talking about the menopause, menopause in corporates. I did a menopause um, workshop in a corporate and they've got an arm over in the U, like um, a, a department over in the US and they just didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to talk about the menopause. But actually, just having, having um, a man potentially look at some of the stuff that I'm creating for the menopause, you know, some of the workshops, sitting them down, actually having a conversation about it. And the same for women, just raising awareness of what's going on for the man as well. Mm. Wow. Well, I would love to talk to each of you about both genders because I, I agree with you 100%. I don't think many people are talking about this. And I mean, we've recorded over 200 episodes and it's not a topic that has come up on our show. And I would consider both huh? of you guys experts on the subject matter. And so I would love to kind of deep dive. Let's start with you, Claire, um, with women. What what are some things that, that women need to know about mon me menopause? When should it start? Um, and what are some misconceptions around it? Uh, so you've got perimenopause and menopause. So menopause is medically, perimenopause is the um, obviously moving into the period of time when you are no longer fertile. So medically, menopause is when you haven't had a menstrual cycle for a year or more. Um, and there are various different symptoms that come on from some women can actually start getting perimenopausal symptoms for about 35 um, but menopause generally starts to happen um, around like 50, so into your 50s. But many, many, many women start to experience perimenopausal symptoms in their 40s. And that's the really tricky time. And this is why I feel so passionate about it, because it's mainly the emotions that that are coming in that they're really, really uncertain of. But it's very confusing. Your body also doesn't feel like it's your own anymore. Your body's changing shape. It's not doing playing ball in the way it used to. What you used to be able to eat is literally going straight to your belly. Um, and emotionally, what happens, I imagine this happens in the US as well, but they'll go to their GP and say, I'm feeling really down. I'm in this vicious cycle. I'm not feeling good about myself. And they just throw them antidepressants. So, you know, what they need to know is about the hormonal changes. I mean, I could literally, I mean, I do, and James does for the um, andropause, I could literally do an entire, probably two podcasts on the hormonal changes and the hormones that need women need to know about to bring compassion 
to themselves because it is not their fault. It is physiological changes that are making them feel this way. And once they know that, they get aha moments and they feel better. And then they can make changes, lifestyle factor changes, which is what, again, I'm really passionate about. Don't wait till the menopause to start doing resistance training, to eat properly, to cut out sugar, to reduce some of your alcohol, to understand what's going on with your body. Don't wait until then. Be prepared. So that's what I would say about the menopause. But I could, I could sit here and hog this for, for ages, but I'll let James talk now. <laughs> Well, it's really interesting that the key hormone that I'm thinking about would be estrogen. Is that is that the key hormone that you have to work with? Yes. And, and also, yeah. go ahead. No, sorry. So estrogen is a really is a really interesting one. Obviously, that's affecting um, just pretty much everything. To be honest with you, it's also it. Um, there's been certain studies that said as we um, drop in estrogen, uh, the fat distribution for women goes from their hips and thighs straight onto their stomach. So a lot of women experience that their clothes don't fit in the same way and they've got this kind of this belly bless us that we, we didn't have before um but estrogen is also um helps um transport serotonin um serotonin is made obviously serotonin is a happy hormone it's 90 percent of it is created in our gut but when estrogen drops because it's a transporter it also helps produce serotonin so when estrogen drops um, our serotonin levels drop, and that's why we start feeling really low and depressed. But again, most people don't even know it's created in the gut. Most people don't know that when your estrogen drops, your serotonin is there drop, therefore dropping, and therefore they don't know what to do um, to help themselves feel better. You know, we always say movement and exercise is nature's best antidepressant. And there's, you know, nourishment, nourishing your body, knowing how to create those feel-good hormones in your body through food. Mm. It, it, I remember hearing this. You can tell me if this is true or not in your opinion. It certainly makes sense to me. But is it, is it true that the estrogens that, that are kind of in our environment at a much greater state today are making women kind of mature way too early and, and like you mentioned earlier, go through menopause too soon? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And impacting men as well. Um, you've got two things going on. You've got um, some foods called like phytoestrogens, which basically mimic estrogen production in the body. So things like soy is a classic example, soy. but there are others. Uh, but then you've also got in the environment like endocrine disruptors as well. So, um, you know, unfortunately we tend to live in quite a polluted environment. It comes from, you know, air pollutants, water pollutants, um, certain plastics, all these things will actually disrupt your normal hormonal cycle or, you know, interfere with your hormones in some way. And the research does seem to suggest that these effects are increasing, mm. you know, uh, which stands to reason, you know, there's more and more pollution. We're using more and more plastics. Um, you know, we're, we're doing more like GM, GMO farming of soya and stuff like this. And there's more in our food chain. Like soya is getting into everything. It now. is in everything. Oh, it's insane. It's crazy. You, you can't even go to like a health food store and buy a bottle of salad dressing that's not full of, of industrial oils, canola, soy, all that stuff. It's everywhere. It's so ubiquitous. It's crazy. Um, I know. Yeah, James, I would love to talk to you about some of the hormonal changes that happen to men. And I, I think what you're also referring to and what you what you mentioned is for men, since they're exposed to all those, you know, environmental, you know, estrogen mimicking things out there, that they are maturing much later than they used to. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure about maturing. What they're, what they're finding is like our T levels, our testosterone levels are, are starting to be lower um, because we're getting so much estrogen like through through our food chain. Um, and also our, our normal our normal hormone pathways are disrupted by these pollutants. I mean, what's going on for men at the male menopause? It, it's not specific for women. It's it's slightly less complex from a hormonal perspective, and it's less less of a window, more of a gradual process. So, men's testosterone production peaks in their mid to late twenties, and then starts to decline at a rate of about one percent per year, depending on the individual. But by the time we're around in our fifty early fifties, say our testosterone levels could be 30 to 50% lower than they were in their 20s. Mm. So that's like a big change. Now, obviously, the impact of that uh, on the physical state is, you know, testosterone plays a role in maintaining and building new muscle. So we'll start to notice a loss in muscle mass, loss in strength, loss of bone density. Uh, it plays a role, you know, like helping energy production. So we'll start to feel yeah, less energetic, less vital. Obviously, plays a role in our in our sexual organs and sexual reproduction. So you know, we can suffer from loss of libido. Um, it plays a role in brain function. Uh, plays a role in our emo just our emotional well being. Like I said, low testosterone is very strongly linked with like you know high anxiety and depression. 
So that's the main one. You've also got declining levels of human growth hormone as well. That's also on a steady decline. That plays um, a similar role. It's not really sex characteristic, but again, regenerating new tissue, new muscle. So that's on the way down. Helps with our metabolism as well. And for men, for men and women, there's research suggests like levels of our hormone leptin, which is the I'm full hormone, are declining as we age. So, you know, we've got this other thing coming in that our leptin could be lower. So we're tempted to eat more so we're not feeling as full when we, when we eat. Um, ghrelin, which is our like um, appetite hormone, can actually increase. Also, for both uh, genders, we become more insulin resistant. So, you know, uh, in, in layman's terms, we're getting less effective about using the food we, we take in for energy. It's more likely to be stored. You know, if you're lucky, it's glycogen. But if you're not, as body fat. So, we're facing this kind of like multiplier effect. You know, testosterone and human growth hormone is falling. Leptin is falling, ghrelin is increasing, we're paying more insulin resistant. Yeah, and I think that's that's the same for, for women as well. So this, that's not all specific to men, it's, it's definitely specific to women and midlife women as well. And then you need to add in cortisol, yeah, our stress. stress hormone, which actually um increases um actually actually increases um the sugar levels in our body as well. So you're you're becoming more insulin resistant, but then because cortisol is in the mix. The sugar in the blood level sugars are, are even higher because you're feeling stressed and you've got that cortisol pumping around the body as well. So it really that's why we always say mind, body, and soul. Mm. So when we approach menopause and menopause, it is mind, body, and soul approach. It has to be holistic in order to manage the symptoms. Yeah, you can see with the menopause, you, I mean, there's so much going on, and then you add stress to the mix. It's like a multiplier effect. It's just, it's so interesting to learn about all of these natural processes and to think back on how we evolved as a species and everything that we've gone through. And then to look out on the landscape and realize like, holy cow, like we, we could not have set this up more worse for ourselves. I mean, I can no. walk to the corner store and buy a bucket of soda, you know, for, for two bucks. It, it's, it's, it's so, you know, it, it's so easy to, you know, consider our evolution and realize that our lifestyles are not set up very well to help us out here and we really need to resist it. I'm curious for each of you to know, is there, I, I love what you mentioned Claire earlier about, um, you know, starting early, starting in your twenties and thirties, not waiting until menopause happens to get started. Is there something specific that does need to change after menopause? Um, or is it pretty much the same stuff when you're 20, 30 or 40? Um, it's pretty much, well, actually you need to have more rest in, so if you're someone that works out anyway, you do need to make sure that you've got your rest right. And actually you're doing the right workouts. A lot of the time people come to us around menopause, perimenopause and menopause, and they're like, you know, I'm, my body's changing shape. I'm putting on weight. Um, so I'm dialing down on my, on my cardio. So I'm now on the treadmill for 45 minutes. I mean, how dull as well, by the way, these poor people come to us and they don't necessarily know any better. So they're just pounding away on the pavement, paying them away on the treadmill. And they're actually putting more stress on their central nervous system, which actually raises cortisol and cortisol actually makes you hold on to body fat. So actually making sure that the perimenopause and menopause are doing the right workouts with the right amount of rest is really important. But I would say, you know, all throughout your life, we should be doing resistance training, so weight training, but even more so at perimenopause and menopause because, like James said, our muscle mass is decreasing, our bone density is decreasing, osteoporosis is a massive thing for menopausal women and after postmenopause. So actually making sure that you are set so you've got a good muscle mass, you've got good bone density, because also we're putting, we are putting on weight. It is harder. Our metabolic rate is lowering anyway as we age, but muscle is more metabolically active um, than fat. So obviously the more muscle we have, the more we're bumping up our metabolic rate and keeping it stable rather than it just bottoming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I couldn't agree more. How have your resistance training methods changed and evolved over the years? <sighs> Lockdown changed them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were in we were in Primrose Hill um near London just with bands in the freezing cut. It was just it was, was an interesting period of time. It was brutal. <laughs> yeah, going down to the park in the rain of about two degrees and, and yeah. Oh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I can totally relate. I, if you would have asked me in March of 2020, if you could get good physical results without having access to a gym, I would have laughed you out of the room, but it's amazing. I, I, most of my clients are in, in parks or in our basement gym using a few bands and you can get amazing results just with yes. that. 
Yes. Exactly. Well, our clients do. Like most of our clients don't actually use a gym. So, and we we, we were forced not to. And I was I was panicking. I was thinking. I'm not going to get, I'm going to lose my body shape. This is going to be awful. And actually I completely maintained um, all my muscle mass and I actually ended up quite liking bands. Mm, that's great. What are some of your favorite exercises to do? Oh, uh, well, listen, well, I think we, when we met, it was quite interesting. I was massively into my hit. I love high intensity interval training. So I was getting Claire up early to all these crazy things. I hated things. him. I hated him. Uh, and she hates <laughs> it. She now loves it. Um, but I didn't really do a lot of weights and she's really got me into my, into my weights, my resistance I love training. My weights. So, I mean, how we schedule our day, when we work with clients, obviously we're taking on board, you know, what's their lifestyle? What do they enjoy to do? What's going to keep them interested and motivated? So we'll work around that and whether it's, you know, home or gym and what's going to get them the results. But for us personally, the way we train is like short bursts of hit and then interspersed with like yeah, a good lifting session of like 45 minutes, mm. splitting body parts. And then um, I also like boxing. I've recently taken up boxing as well. So that's like a new challenge for me to... You did get a hit around the head the other day quite a lot, though. Well, it has got... me quite a lot. Yeah. Oh, no. I haven't learned... <laughs> I haven't learned to uh, not get hit yet, but I will. <laughs> um, I think I've changed the way I train just because of more knowledge. You know, like I was thinking, I was one of those women that was like the cardio queen before I re-qualified and do, do what I do now. I was just there on the treadmill, 45 minutes in the gym, and the PTs would come up to me and say, Clay, you do know you did that yesterday. And <laughs> you should do some hit. And I was like, no, 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 inside my comfort zone. Don't don't ask me to do any hit. And um yeah, I mean, my training is is just so much more specific now. And I, I, like James said, I love, I love lifting weights. I love, I love doing all sorts of different programs, and I love helping women. <laughs> I'm allowed to say this. I love helping women lift their butts, mm. so that their butts are fatter and rounder. Because a lot of women end up um, doing the wrong exercises and building out their quads. And they're like, "Why isn't I'm doing these leg exercises? Why isn't my um, aren't my glutes?" and becoming firmer and rounder I'm like it's because you're doing the wrong exercises mm -hmm. so I love that yeah, totally. My whole career before the pandemic for, uh, let's see, 13 years was measuring metabolic rate on people using um, gas exchange. And so we would throw a mask on somebody and measure their metabolic rate, how many calories they were burning, how much fat versus sugar they were burning during exercise. And it, it just became so predictable. All the people that were on the one side of the gym with all the cardio machines would tend to have lower than normal metabolic rates, like you mentioned earlier. And the people yes. that would go to the other side of the gym would not only spend less time in the gym, but their bodies would change and very very predictably, they would have higher than average metabolic rates. <laughs> and it freed up so much time for them. They could go into the gym, get their lifting done, do some high intensity if they wanted, get out of there, and then go enjoy life, go on a walk, go paddleboard, yeah, go on a bike ride, all of that stuff. Yes. Yeah, totally. That's like music to our ears. Totally. Yeah. 100%. Mm, love that. What are some of the pillars of nutrition that you guys like to talk about? Ooh, pillars of nutrition. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm mean, recording. There's, there's so many. I mean, uh, we, to we totally not believe in fad diets. I mean, we basically coach our clients to, to try and get back to a whole food diet um, because, you know, we're seeing more and more processed foods and now ultra processed foods come in. There's all kind of research around these. They're, they're overriding our natural hormonal pathway. So we don't realize we're full. So we just keep, you know, we've all experienced that. I, I won't name the brands, but you get you get those uh, potato chips. And I'm using potato in inverted commas here in a tube. And you think, oh, I'll just have a couple. But then, like, suddenly the whole tube's disappeared. Once you pop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so we basically uh, coach our clients to go back to a whole food diet. We always say a rainbow on your plate of fresh vegetables. And from food or seed to table with as few steps in between as possible. Interesting. But also enjoy your food. We've forgotten that, you know, um, in our society, we've become in this, like, quick fix obsessed. You know, it's so easy, like you were saying earlier, to... to have food delivered to you, pick up a meal you just put in a microwave. We've kind of lost our relationship with food. And then we've learned to fear it a bit as well, I think. You know, people are always worried about their weight. Um, and we always should, shouldn't forget that, that what we eat is how we nourish. You know, nutrition is the root of the word. It's from nourishment. So it's about nourishing our body and having respect for what we're putting in and respecting our body. So we strive for balance. Like, you know, we're not saying... You know, never eat chocolate cake again but we're like you know maybe don't have chocolate cake three times a day every day like have a good sensible diet 80 percent of the time enjoy your splurges the other 20 percent of the time you know go have your burger um you know have some beers but 
It's about learning to live with your life in balance. I think um, also making sure that a lot of um, midlifers eat enough protein mm. because um, a lot of people find it quite hard to get enough protein in their diet, but good quality protein. So a lot of people now are going out and buying all these protein shakes that are laden with sugar and nasty chemicals. But actually, you know, raising your the levels of protein that you're eating a day triggers leptin, which is your iron four hormone. So a lot of people say that that's a game changer is having good quality protein for each of their meals and actually front loading your carbohydrates. So we're not like super low carb at all, um, but we're not high carb either. We're kind of like somewhere mid range where we say to people, you know, again, one of the biggest game changers is cutting out uh, high GI carbs after four o'clock and just front loading them with some good oat, you know, oats in the morning, a little bit brown rice if you want it in the afternoon but just coming, cutting out carbs in the evening because, you know, they're laden with sugar, you know, they're high GI, they're laden with sugar and we're becoming more insulin resistant as we're aging. So it's going to become harder anyway to process those sugars. Yeah, no, that's right. Couldn't agree more. I love the focus on protein and the reduction of sugar. It's just, it's, it's so crazy. It's everywhere. And really the only way to avoid it is finding those whole foods. And I don't know about your experience, but I, I sure seem to notice that when somebody starts eating in that way, it's almost so much easier to tell them they can have a piece of chocolate cake every now and again, and they just kind of won't. Like your taste buds truly change. Yeah. Is that what you've noticed with your clients as well? Oh, 100%. You can definitely train your, your taste buds. Yeah, the, um, the palate becomes, you know, we've we've got a palate now that's been designed. It was some, it's something crazy, like uh, bananas here in the UK are now like 20 times sweeter than they were 20 years ago or something like that. And, you know, people think, oh, you know, having a banana in the morning, you know, that's great, but it's going to spike your insulin. And a lot of stuff out there is spiking people's insulin without even insulin response, without even knowing it. But yeah, you absolutely, you can retrain your palate but we just got so used to everything having sugar in it that at first you get a sugar withdrawal. You know, people find it really, really hard to get off sugar. I was going to say, there's some research we saw that was fairly recent uh, with rats and they were like comparing sugar and cocaine. And, and the scary thing was they found that um, if the rats were given unlimited quantities of both, they would self-regulate cocaine eventually but they were incapable of regulating the sugar. They would just keep gorging themselves nonstop. Yeah, and actually, within a two-week period, they were eating something like 25% more sugar in a two-week period. So they couldn't... It wasn't that they couldn't even self-regulate. It was they were, they were eating more and more. Wow. More. Well, how about we do this? Let's just take every birthday party, celebration, office celebration. Let's just switch out all the sugar for cocaine and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> That's insane. It doesn't surprise me. Services. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah, no, it doesn't surprise me. I had an experience a few months ago where I, you know, I bought a pie and I started eating the pie and I could not stop. Like if you told me to stop, I was not able to do it. And I didn't think I had a lot of sugar addiction issues. And I, I certainly do to some degree. And it's interesting about the taste buds, like the way we're breeding, even things like fruit, like fruit is very, very sweet. Once you start eating real whole foods, yeah. it, it's funny too. I have to just mention this on one of your episodes that you did recently. Um, the guest told you, that apples were it was eight or nine months old by the time that you got them in the in the shop yeah wow that's yeah. that's at least four to six months earlier than we get them here in america they call them birthday apples generally speaking it's it's, wow. it, it's generally like wow. over a year yeah that's <laughs> just terrifying isn't terrible. it yeah yes. terrible and that's a, a arguably healthy reasonable food it's crazy yeah our food system has issues um Okay, so you mentioned approaching this all holistically, and I want to make sure that we talk about, you know, what you mentioned, the soul and emotional resilience, and, and how and where did that fit in? I know that that's something you like to lead with and have conversations with your spouse, but in what ways do you work with your clients to make sure that emotionally they're taking care of their soul along with their physical body? Well, I think... Um, I think it comes naturally anyway from, from our background because... You know, it is psychology, NLP, stress management. We, we loved all that stuff anyway. So we, we've been our own guinea pigs, right, with what works and what doesn't for years and years and years and years and years. But actually, you know, it, everything is 80% mindset. This is what we say. 80% mindset, 20% doing. But most people are doing 80% um, doing, even like 5% mindset. And the problem with that is we always say you cannot outperform your own self-identity. So it doesn't matter how much you're doing something. If you're not looking at your belief systems 
and things like self-sabotage, inner critic, imposter syndrome. If you're not looking at all of that stuff, you can do everything you want in the world, but actually that will always win out. So it'll always pull you back. Your subconscious mind will always pull you back to the familiar. Um, you know, it will always seek pleasure over pain. Um, so it will always pull you back. When you go for something new, it always gets you caught. So we always say 80% mindset, and that's where we get people really looking at their why. Like, why are you even wanting this? Why are you even wanting to go for this? We work with visualization. We work with affirmations because um, it's everything. It is absolutely everything. This is where self-sabotage comes in all the time. You know, you're doing something, but then, you know, you don't, you're not aware of your habits. You're not um, aware of what you believe about yourself and about the world. So that kicks in. And then you wonder why the doing part has completely gone out the window. Yeah, I mean, we work a lot, like Claire said there, on, on like limiting beliefs, looking at what beliefs we might have that are going to hold us back. How can we shift those towards more positive ones? And thing, like, yeah, we spend a lot of time talking with clients about how tricky our minds can be. You know, we, we're, you know, the human brain will always seek pleasure over pain, but it also will seek to reinforce to get you back to your old pathways. Because um, you know, the neuroscience says that we build these new neural pathways in our, in our brains. And the thicker they are, the, the deeper those run. So we'd always try and revert back to them, but we can reshape them, we can change them. So, you know, those mornings where you know, the alarm goes off and you're meant to go to the gym, but your, your old reptilian brain's going, stay in bed, get up late, go and have a nice, like, cookie and coffee later. It's seeking the pleasure path. You've got to actually recognize that it's doing that and override it and go, hey, yeah, thanks for that. But you know what? Today we're going to go up and get to the gym because that's what I deserve as a person and that's what I'm going to do. And then over time, when you practice that consistently, you will actually form new neural pathways and that will become your new def default behavior. Like, you know, we have clients, they're like, oh, the alarm goes off and I just want to go to, yeah, the thought of actually just not getting up or, or going for like an indulgent breakfast. It doesn't even part of my mindset and my, of my makeup anymore. Mm, I think the why, making sure that when that happens, their why is strong enough to so keep going back to the why. Why, yeah. why, 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 why? You know, a lot of the time it's, you know, I want to live... I don't want to just live a long life. I want to live a good quality of life. I want to see my children grow up. I want to see my grandchildren. You know, it's those emotional connections to being healthy and happy and empowered yeah. and the best version of yourself so that your kids are proud of you, you know, um, and that you're a good role model. Those are the really powerful whys. You know, a lot of the time, they, you know, people come to us and say, you know, my mum's, you know, my mum or, or family member has passed away from this, this and this. I don't want it to be me. Okay, that's your one. Let's go. Let's make sure that that is not you because that's your responsibility and your control. Mm. And I think for a lot of people, they feel like, you know, it, it's almost like too far gone for them. You know, they, they've made poor decisions in the past and they've got a long way to go. But I don't think a lot of people realize it's really just taking uh, one step after another and, and slowly things improve over time and you start to build momentum, like you said, by implementing those changes. And don't you find that for most people, it's easier than they initially think it, it yes. has to be? Yes, a hundred percent, because actually you get proud of yourself. The sense of pride becomes slightly addictive. So that, oh my goodness, I'm trusting myself more. I believe in myself more. This feels nice. This feels better than the negative Nancy, I call it, in the, in the head. You know, I'm, and momentum breeds momentum. Once you get going, the tracks are in motion, the wheels are in motion, and actually it's like a flywheel. It just keeps on going, keeps on going. And with the right accountability and the support, which is what we, you know, we do give that to our clients and actually we give it to each other, James and I. But with that, with that support, honestly, I, anything is possible. We have seen so many amazing transformations from people that have come to us and just said, I can't do this. You're, you're my last stitch attempt. I mean, that, that, that's when we look at those people and go, oh, now here's, this is going to be great. Because it's actually those people that are the, the lowest point that I have to say are the ones that when we come out on the other side are just like, wow, you know, it changes everything. It impacts everything. How you feel about yourself, your health, um, you know, your health is your greatest wealth. And if you don't have that, your body is the only home you ever truly have. As we always say, you have to respect it. You have to look after it. And once you do from there, everything else starts improving.
Mm, that's so well explained. I definitely notice the same thing um, with our clients as well. If you're just getting a small win, even if it's you know putting on your gym shorts and walking out to the mailbox and back or something, if that's where you have to start, then start there. And and you're right, it does build momentum. I'm so glad you mentioned your relationship. This is kind of a selfish question, as I am you know also fortunate enough to work with my wife and my best friend. Um, you know, we we are able to do our work together post pandemic, which is absolutely such an amazing and wonderful gift. How do you guys show up for your, for each other in your relationship, both as business owners and friends, but also as spouses? Oh, what a great question. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love you two work together as well. Uh, and, and you'll get this, like we're so blessed because yeah, for so many people, well, um, pre pandemic, you know, a lot of people would be like the, the couple and they get up and they go to work for like eight to 10 hours and they get back and they're tired and they just eat something and then go to bed and then repeat, repeat, repeat. They don't really get to spend time with that person. So I feel, feel so blessed I get to spend this time with Claire, but also like creating, you know, so much wonderful stuff. But how we show up is really important on the flip side of that is, is having boundaries around different areas. So, you know, when you're working for yourself and it's your own business and you love what you're doing, you're passionate, it can be really easy to find yourself still still talking about that, you know, like late into the night. So, of course, we do do that, but we're really strict with ourselves saying, OK, you know, let's have a date night. When we're on a date night, we're not talking about work. Oh, we're, we're finished with work for today. You know, just drawing those lines, having those boundaries is a form of respect for yourself and the other person. Uh, but more than that, just making sure you're investing in a relationship. Like, you know, my one of my drivers is making sure that I want to show up as the best version of me every day that I can to be to be good for Claire. And he does. And it's it's really lovely. And I think um it's exactly that. I think it's about, you know, also having time apart and making sure that I always say that and <laughs> comes across as but making sure that you do have your own interests as well mm. is a way to keep it fresh because actually if you're in each other's pockets like we literally are you know like the pandemic it was like nothing's changed we're still in each other's pockets and we were before <laughs> um but but actually making sure that we do our own thing like james does his boxing i go off and do um like some of my spiritual retreats that i absolutely love i go off and do other stuff i go walk in nature on my own i go off and do my own thing and that's really really important because um then you feel like you are free to be you and then you can come back and you've learned something about yourself even from that time apart but also knowing each other's little quirks and respecting those and knowing that a lot of the time as human beings we project a lot of our stuff on those closest to us like we assume I think I said this at the beginning we assume what people are thinking we assume what they're feeling and I think that's been the biggest learning I'm like if James annoys me or I'm, I'm seeing something I'm like ah oh, it's really frustrating me I'm like okay what am I frustrated in myself right now what what's going on in me right now because I don't want to show up as that angry little thing to to James right now I don't want to show up like that I don't want to be that person that's not the best version of myself so what can I do right now to sort myself out before I have that conversation with him and then it most of the time it's not necessary anymore because I've actually realize it's something going on for myself it's not him at all mm. yeah i love that i i had to learn that the hard way after my divorce and realizing like why why do all these women have all the same problem i don't get it and then sitting down to think well wait a second dummy like you're the culprit like work on yourself yeah. and then everybody else will be different to you because you're showing up in life in such a different way and you're doing the only true work that you can really do which is on yourself yeah yeah exactly absolutely mm. absolutely showing up for yourself if you're showing up for yourself and wanting to be the best version of yourself and like being aware of what your patterns of behavior are what your patterns of thoughts what your triggers are you can always like tie it back to you you know a lot of the time if you're frustrated at someone else it's a frustration at you or you haven't set your boundaries properly or all that stuff the responsibility for how you feel is within you and you know there's a lot about outside things that aren't in control but what you can control is how you react to things yeah. so that includes you know, your, your relationship with your partner. Mm, I love that. 
Uh, it's such a power couple and such a wonderful example. I have a question about a recent podcast that you did. This is something that I really struggle with, and I would love um, your honest answer. You did a podcast episode about season change, and as we are going through this recording, a, a, a very cold storm <laughs> just rolled through, and we're definitely noticing the season change around here. We're heading into you know fall of 2021, and the days are getting much shorter. The nights are getting much longer. I, as I notice as the years go on that I'm much more sensitive to to those changes. I feel more tired. I crave different foods. Um, I don't have as much energy as I normally do. And for, for a successful couple that wants to go out into the world and kick ass and run your business and, and have success, how, how are you able to rest and know that it's time to rest in your own personal life without, you know, overextending yourself or pushing past what you feel is enough? All this, oh, all right this question. is very poignant because um, I, and Jane's house as well, I have been like a striver, like strive, strive, strive. And I've always kind of, I don't know, you get in this neurotic cycle of just working and not resting. And, you know, it's only come for me in about the last year where I'm really, really noticing what's driving that. And you know what? I genuinely think it's like a trauma response when you're constantly uh, busy, 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 busy. It's like a trauma response of not feeling safe. It's a trauma response of not trusting the universe is a benevolent one and that you can rest. And that's your natural state as well. Because as our ancestors, that podcast, our ancestors reap the harvest and then they would just rest and take stock a little bit. But it's a feeling of not safe, of not, like losing things and not being safe just to be able to sit in your own space and connect with yourself. And I honestly, since I've been doing that more in the last year, I honestly think my everything has transformed for me, allowing myself to trust and receive, receive the fruits of my labor. And that I'm safe to is a massive thing for me. Mm, I mean, I'll say that. I mean, yeah, I've yeah, both of us definitely very guilty of like overextending in the past, you know, just like feeling like we're on a furiously flying around hamster wheel, <laughs> legs going ten to the dozen to keep the thing spinning. But um, you know, actually realizing that like, like the hamster wheel, well, actually wasn't carrying us anywhere, we were just like stuck in one place. So we let learning go a lot. to trust, yeah, learning to trust and relax. And you know, what I started to think about, you know, was was you know, or am I am I pushing to do this, or am I making decisions? Is it, is it coming from a place of fear? Because you never make good decisions from a place of fear. And then I'd be like, okay, I am. So therefore, what would be the opposite, or what's a different way to look at this, and what could be a different decision that I make? Because. I don't want to make a fear-based decision. Yeah. But the season, the seasons are tough. We have an actual ebb and flow, but I think it's really important we respect them, you know, and it's not saying, you know, take, totally take your foot off the gas in winter by any means, but maybe it's time just to, like, take a step back, take a deep breath, reflect on what's gone, and then, like, apply, like we were talking about earlier, apply those learnings, go, okay, what, what was great and I should do more of, and it also lit me up. What maybe wasn't so great, uh, actually, I want to just dump it completely, or if I just tweak it and reinvent it, I can go for it again and see what happens. I think for me, it was more like my big awakening was what's the most important thing to me? My most important thing to me is to live one amazing, amazing, beautiful life. And I want to be present. I want to be in it. I don't want to be constantly looking ahead or looking behind me. I want to be in it. And I think when you're not giving yourself enough time to rest, you're just not present. And I think being grateful for what's here and now only happens really when you're present. And there is nothing more important to me than to have that connection with my higher self and, you know, and the universe. There's nothing more important than from that, everything else flows. Wow. That was a wonderful and very thoughtful answer. Relaxing, trusting, allowing. We just have so little of that in our lives. And I think most of us do tend toward, you know, being in the pinwheel and never leaving. And, and you're right, like without, without recharging and, and allowing ourselves to, to take that rest when we need it. I, it's just so critical and so, so difficult to feel like, you know, you're a person who's really driven and successful and you're an entrepreneur and running a business. And, and I, I call it the E word, like learning when is enough is really quite a challenge that I really struggle with. So I really appreciate that answer. Yeah. Um, you guys have so much content and put out so many great things in the world. What are some of the things you're most excited about now? Oh, oh well, Jace is doing his RISE program. I'm really excited about that for him because I think, you know, um, there's so many men out there um, that really, really 
need that safe space to to work with someone like James, who is super inspiring, but also has had his own journey. Um, and just on that, you know, the the statistics are absolutely terrifying. In England and Wales last year, 75% of all the suicides were men and most of them were midlife. So it's mm. really what I feel like incredibly proud of James doing his Rise programme. Yeah, um, I'm really stoked for that. I mean, this this has like been a real labour of love for me. Like, it was obviously the physical side to it, but I spent so long basically being a whole toolkit for, for, the, for the emotions and the mind in there as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of coming very, very soon. And I'm doing my own female programme. Uh, but the other big thing I worry so about is like we've been talking about a book for two years now, and I think the time has come it to has. actually uh, start getting it out. So, um, yeah, we'll be, we'll, the watch, book. Watch this, uh, watch this space. We'll be doing a book. We've kind of, we've got the the skeleton idea, but we just need to actually, like <laughs> like you were saying, you know, find the time. Try, find it, make the time, make, make the time. time. Wow, that's awesome. I'll be looking out for that. That's so cool. Um, I, I don't know how people just decide to write a book and then come up with a book. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I could ever do that. That's incredible. Good for you guys. That's so cool. Uh, that's amazing. And lockdowns are pretty much over where you are, right? And so are you working with people one-on-one? Um, yeah. yeah. We're, we're uh, you know, barely any restrictions here at the moment. So, um, yeah, most of our work, though, has stayed as, as online or virtual. Um, and we just have like very few clients who actually work with in, in person, but yeah. we, have, we have been doing it. And we run retreats. We're, we're running retreats again in Marbella, in Spain, in January and February. So we're really excited. We did one in the UK and it got fully booked straight away. I think everyone was just really excited to see real people, you know, mm-hmm. so um, and actually do stuff with us in person. So that was fully booked. And it was amazing. It was just incredible. Um, so we're keen to do another two of those in Marbella in January and February. Awesome. That's amazing. We'll link to all of that in the show notes. That's great. Um, wow. Thank we've you. covered so much ground. You guys have been so uh, inspiring and educational. What is one simple thing that you would like to leave with the listener to walk away from this conversation with? It doesn't matter where you are. Um, anything is possible for you it doesn't matter where you are miracles can happen um and you know your life is too precious and too beautiful you deserve to live the best life healthy and happy and anything is possible for you i love that yeah i echo that i just you know one of the things to say is like you know if you if you're looking at it and you're thinking you know i can't do that i can't do it just look around you know has someone else similar to you done it achieved it then ask yourself is it it's, it clearly is possible is it just i just don't know how to do it why not me why not me um don't be afraid to ask for help and just do take that first small step but as importantly keep on taking the steps because like we said momentum build momentum you know the person that's putting on their gym shorts and walking out to the mailbox and back today could be like yeah. you know running for miles like in a few months time so just just take the small steps and keep taking them and you can do it Mm, I love that. Claire and James Davis, where can people go to find you, connect with you and your work? You can go to our website, which is the Midlife Mentors with an S because there's two of us. <laughs> the Midlife Mentors.com. Uh, we are, you'll find all about us there, but you can find us on Instagram at Midlife Mentors. Got a bit annoyed that we couldn't get the Midlife Mentors, but it's at Midlife Mentors and Instagram. Um, and our podcast is the midlife mentors and we're on youtube as the midlife mentors too awesome that's about it i think i've covered everything <laughs> <laughs> well that's great we will link also to all of that in the show notes thank you guys so much both of you i think it's a really smart approach that you're taking i think you're focusing on uh, something that's very needed the midlife area of, of of our lives and and really dialing in with the genders male and female because those are so different things and need uh, you know different ways of approaching it and it's so cool to see the two of you work together and put out such amazing content so claire and james davis thank you so much for everything that you do and thank you for a appearing on our show. It's been really amazing to talk to you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been amazing talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's an honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. 